Hi folks, this is Mark by Mark A. Foster PhD for the Maoist Third Worldist Collective. I have been thinking about my recent podcasts, which are really a reflection of what's been going on inside of my head. And I've come to one important conclusion, and this is it. I have been looking at these subjects from a really, really negative point of view. And um, as a result, I think, my podcasts have been rather depressing. I've been talking about all of these horrendous things, for example, happening in Palestine, with all the deaths that are occurring right there, the disunity which exists between Israel and Palestine, the way in which um, Palestine has been dominated or oppressed by the nation of Israel for so many years. And I've been leaving out in my discussions the philosophy of meta-reality, which again is the final stage of the late Roy Baskar's philosophy of critical realism. There are many different dimensions to Roy's philosophy, but two that I've already discussed, I think are perhaps the most important. One is demi-reality, and the other is co-presence. One that I have not yet discussed, at least not by this name, is Roy's concept of alethic truth. In a way that sounds to be redundant. In fact, that was my first thought when I read that term used, because the word althea in Greek means truth. So it's like saying truth, truth. But what Roy, I believe, intended by alethic truth is the reality that exists of causal mechanisms. The causal mechanisms which make things happen, meaning the deeper truth, the unobservable reality, which can also be called the real. The realm of these causal mechanisms, the forces, the patterns, the energies, which make things happen. So if we want to know why things happen, Roy said, basically look for the causal mechanism. Look for the factors that might be involved in making something occur. In other words, simple cause and effect. Um, what Roy did, as I mentioned before, is he rejected the rigidity of laws in favor of a lithic truth, in favor of causal mechanisms. Why? Again, because in his view, laws were too rigid and determinative. If something is a law, that means that it's fixed. It can't change. But we know from our experience that that is really not true. For example, we can talk about the law of gravity. Well, gravity can be defined based upon how we observe it, that any object of whatever size or mass or volume in a vacuum will fall at a constant rate of approximately 32 feet per second squared. But is that gravity? No, that's not gravity. That's what we observe of gravity. That is the actuality of gravity, not the reality of gravity. When we observe gravity empirically, we can't observe the reality of gravity, because we don't know what gravity is. Nobody really knows what gravity is. Nobody's ever seen gravity. 
Till this day, there are speculations on whether gravity is a kind of magnetism, some kind of electromagnetic force or something else. Nobody really knows for sure. Many worlds. No one's ever seen one. Strings. However many, many strings there are, and that is a matter which is debated by quantum physicists, no one has seen a string either. So we can talk about these things in a theoretical or metaphysical sense, but we can't really talk about these things observationally because we are talking, in effect, about causal mechanisms. That is aletheic truth. So I think that those three concepts are key, at least for now, in our use of the philosophy of meta-reality. First, again, the concept of demi-reality. Second, the concept of co-presence. And third, the concept of aletheic truth, causal mechanisms. And so rather than try to dwell on so much negativity upon the disunity or the demi-reality which exists in the world today, such as between Palestine and Israel, and the way in which Israel has been for so long oppressing the Palestinians, treating them as, I would say, subhuman. Certainly, certainly not rec recognizing their humanity, their right to human dignity, placing the lives of Israelis higher than the lives of Palestinians. That's all demi-reality. Selfishness, splitting, disunity, alienation. What we need is to replace that demi-reality which seems to be governing the world right now, including in the Near East, with a new type of meta-reality, meta philosophy of meta-reality, and that is what Roy called co-presence, which is really the heart of meta-reality. It is the way in which meta-reality can be realized in this world by establishing genuine unity between myself and the other. As an autistic, I know that for most of my life, I lived literally in a world of demi-reality, of alienation of separation. One of the more common, although not universal, traits of autism, and one that I had, is a virtual inability to look into the eyes of another person. I often say that when I would try to do that, and sometimes that would be demanded of me by a teacher, say in elementary school, look at me in the eyes. Not understanding how much torment that person would be, be putting me through by, by forcing me to do that. But I would do it. I would do it. But when I would do it, it was like I wasn't really looking at the person. I was instead looking 
at the sun. It was as if somebody had told me, go stare at the sun. That's not very comfortable. Maybe it's okay during a sunrise or a sunset, although I don't think that's particularly healthy for the eyes either. Certainly during an eclipse, when the sun is even dimmer, that's even more dangerous because the rays are even more intense and you can easily damage your eyes by looking at the sun during an eclipse. But for me, looking into someone's eyes anytime had a very similar feel. Now, I have never looked at an eclipse. I always followed the guidance of scientists and didn't do it. But when I would look at the sun occasionally, even through the corner of my eye, that was a very similar sensation for me to, look, to looking directly at the sun. That is an experience of demi-reality, meaning it prevented me from being at one with that other individual. It was a block. It was a block. It blocked my empathy, or as I prefer using Edmund Husserl's term intersubjectivity, I was not able to connect my heart with the heart of another person. Fortunately, that time has passed. As a result of a spiritual experience I had about 20 years ago, I now have tremendous empathy. Sometimes I think too much. But then when I think back upon my life, I say, no, no, it's not too much. There can never be too much empathy, at least for me. As someone who grew up without any empathy at all, without any love for anybody, my parents, my grandparents, my wonderful Aunt Hannah, my spiritual mother, Elizabeth Thomas, and many others I was drawn to, including, including the great Persian scholar Zekor Lachadim, whom I was very close with. I knew these people well. but I could not love them. I could not look into their eyes. I could not see them for who they were. Now, because of that experience I had 20 years ago, I can do that. I can see people. I can feel people. I can love people. I can experience genuine empathy for people. So, I look at the Israelis and I listen to this recent disgusting Israeli pop song which glorifies the killing of Palestinians and talks about them as if they are animals not worthy of respect and dignity i look at that and i think these people in a sense remind me of my autism i'm not saying that they're autistic or all of them are autistic 
My assumption would be that most of them are not. But in a way, they suffer from the same malady as I did. An inability to experience true co-presence or unity. So what I think is needed on the part of Israel before Israel consumes itself in hatred or before some other countries decides in hatred to consume Israel. Is that Israelis, especially Israelis serving in the government, but not exclusively them, Israelis in general, develop a genuine co-presence, unity, empathy, love for Palestinians. I'm not saying they should use the U.S. as an example. We are not an example of almost anything that I would consider to be good or, or worthwhile in the world. The U.S., I believe, is the most politically corrupt nation on the face of the earth. No place is more corrupt than my country. We are the head of empire. We are the reason, the primary reason, why the primary contradiction of the dialectic, imperialism, continues to assert its mighty grip over the third world. That's my country. That's the country I was born into, and yet it is a country I cannot repair alone. I don't really know if anybody can repair it. Maybe, but it doesn't seem too likely to me. So, my view over the last, I would say, 24 hours on this whole matter of Palestine has shifted. It is not that I despise what Israel is doing any less than, than I did before. It is certainly not that I excuse Israel any more than I did before. It is not that I feel any less compassion for the Palestinians that are dying in such unimaginable numbers at the hands of the Israeli Defense Forces. No, those are all the same. What has changed, I suppose, is my perspective a bit. In a sense, I've come back to myself. What I've realized is that the the affairs of a broken world have broken me as well. I feel broken by the first world. I am broken by the first world. The first world, I think, breaks each of its inhabitants one by one. And in the end, we will all be destroyed. But is there hope? Yeah. Yeah. The hope lies in alethic truth, in the causal mechanisms of unity. 
the causal mechanisms of co-presence, which can work to transform us, not only as individuals, that's important too, but it's not sufficient, but also as collective bodies, as families, as communities, as nations, and as the world. Those causal mechanisms need to defeat demi-reality. Need to lead us out of the room of demi-reality. It's like being in a room with all sorts of trap doors. People standing behind doors waiting to stab knives into you. Hand grenades waiting to be exploded if you step on them. Improvised explosive devices. Well, if anyone were in a room like that, The first question would, in, would invariably be, how in the world do I get out of this hellhole? Demi-reality is that hellhole. And we have no one else but ourselves to blame for creating it. It is not a natural law. Selfishness, contrary to what Adam Smith wrote in Wealth of Nations and elsewhere, selfishness is not human nature. Well, maybe it's our lower nature, but it's not what I think of as human nature, our higher nature. Our higher nature is co-presence and the alethic truth, the causal mechanisms which, which dominate that higher nature of co-presence. And so it is to that co-presence, I think, when looking at the third world and considering the tragedies right now that people who live in Palestine and elsewhere are forced to adjust themselves to and adjust their children to. I have never had any kids, so it's hard for me to relate to the idea of being a parent, although I can somewhat someone. And I cannot imagine the torment of seeing my own hypothetical children forced to live in a world dominated by demi-reality, by the lower nature of demi-reality, not by the higher nature of co-presence. And so all that Adam Smith was talking about in Wealth of Nations, all that capitalism is, is that lower nature of demi-reality. All that imperialism is, is that lower nature of demi-reality. All that cultural hegemony, examined brilliantly by Antonio Gramsci is, is that lower nature of demi-reality expanded to a world and potentially destroying our very hearts. 
And so I think as I have reconsidered the approach I have been taking to these podcasts, which in my view has been much too negative, and I will try to change that. It, it is just the beginning of that, though. I can't guarantee that I will be successful right away. But I will make an attempt. I will have to figure out new ways of approaching these things. I don't regret entirely having said the things I've said. But what I feel as though is that by speaking of Palestine in such a hopeless way, it's an expression of my own sense of hopelessness. But there is no reason why I should experience constant hopelessness. No reason. I should be able to rise above that and to see the world through the eyes of co-presence or unity. Unity is where our future lies. Unity is what I believe will be created by the third world should the dialect to cooperate and should human agency drive the people of the third world in that direction? And I sure hope it does. Because I won't be there. I can make these podcasts, which I hope will be seen by people in the third world and throughout the first world as well. But I cannot take the place of the people in the third world who will need to be stalwart in their determination to completely eliminate the plague of demi-reality from all parts of our planet. This has been Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. Have a pleasant day and an even better day tomorrow.